All right, so we are looking at Unit 6. We are in thermodynamics, so we're going to start off by looking at the gas laws. So I want a question for you to answer um, to help us kick off our discussions today. Um, is as follows. Which of the following variables were changing during our Coke bottle thermometer activity yesterday? Select all that apply and cite observations as evidence in your responses. Please take a moment to complete this bellwork response. So we're looking at 6.1 behavior of ideal gases. Announcements, we have nothing immediate um, on the horizon. So what we're up to today, measurements for pressure and temperature and thermodynamics. Ideal versus non-ideal gases. What are the difference between ideal and non-ideal gases? What does that mean? Why do we talk about ideal gases versus non-ideal? Gas Law Lab, um, that's what um, we are doing outside of the video. Unfortunately, that can't be done here. Um, and then what variables affect the behavior of a gas, um, aka the gas laws. And then mathematically, mo mathematically modeling gas laws. Um, so in this last portion right here, the last half hour or so, of course it won't take half an hour of the video, um, we'll be looking at how we can uh, describe the relationships between the variables that we use to describe gas laws, and then how can we um, quantify those relationships. Okay. So new units for pressure and temperature, new units, new unit, new unit. All right, so in temperature, um, we use Kelvin and degrees Celsius um, for temperature, um, as opposed to Fahrenheit, which is typically used in the United States. Okay, the relationship between Kelvin and Celsius is that the temperature in Kelvin is equal to the temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. So using this equation right here, you can convert back and forth from Kelvin to Celsius and vice versa, okay? So an example right here is that, um, let's say I measure something as having a temperature of 1230 Kelvin, then the measurement in degrees Celsius is going to be 1230 minus 273.15 um, degrees Kelvin, which is going to be, give us 956.85 degrees Kelvin. So it's just, or excuse me, Celsius. So it's just a shift of 273.15 degrees, okay? Um, Kelvin is useful because Kelvin is used to define absolute minimum temperatures. So there's a minimum temperature in the universe called absolute zero from which we measure all temperatures. So it's this base temperature and Kelvin is, um, and zero Kelvin is representative of absolute zero. So we measure every temperature starting from this absolute zero, zero Kelvin. Okay. Now for pressure, we have new units for pressure. Okay, we have Pascals measured in PA or Pennsylvania's, which is useful for large measurements of pressure. All right, so like tire pressure, um, PS, things that we might typically measure as PSI United States, okay? Tor, which is millimeters of mercury, which is useful for smaller measurements of pressure. Um, and that's used to measure, say, blood pressure. If you've ever been to the United States, or excuse me, if you've ever been to um, a doctor and you've ever had blood pressure taken, your blood pressure is recorded in Tor, millimeters of mercury. And the way that we define it is that traditionally, um, Pressure traditionally used to be measured um, historically um, by the um, amount that a sample of mercury rose when a certain amount of pressure was applied to mercury. All right, then atmospheres or ATM is useful for measurements of atmospheric pressure. Um, we are we define that in terms of relation to our own atmosphere. So one ATM is the atmospheric pressure that we typically limit. All right, so everything in this unit is defined in terms of kinetic theory, okay? Um, and everything is defined in terms of ideal gases and ideal objects. So what is kinetic theory and what are ideal gases, okay? So the main goal is to study kinetic theory, okay? Um, kinetic theory, the main idea behind kinetic theory is that we have these is that um, gases can be treated as these idealized little particles that are bouncing around and thus temperature is a measure of the um, average kinetic energy of these particles here. Hence why we say it's kinetic theory. So in a way, temperature is a measure of how much a gas is bouncing around. The more gas bounces around, the higher the temperature, the less gas bounces around um, or material bounces around. Um, the lesser temperature that material or gas has, okay? So um, we talk about ideal gases in physics as opposed to um, non-ideal gases. Um, and we'll talk about why in a second and what the properties are for an ideal gas, okay? So ideal gas properties, um, 
are individual identical particles that occupy no space. Okay, so in kinetic theory, we treat our gas as made up of these simple particles that have um, no internal structure. They aren't made up of electrons or protons or neutrons, and they occupy no space. Space. They're what we call point particles in physics. Okay. Since they occupy no space, we treat that the point particles have a large distance between each neighboring particle. Okay. And we say that besides the collisions, there are no interactions between particles, okay? Um, so we know in reality that particles, um, gases, are, tend to be made up of ions or they're made up of molecules which can have um, areas of positive charge and negative charge. So as a result, you're going to have electric traction and repulsion between atoms and molecules. Um, but to simplify this, because that can get quite complex, um, to simplify this, we exclude elect electric interactions, and we say there's no interactions besides collisions. Okay, so if you want to think of a gas in um, kinetic theory and thermodynamics, it's best to think of that gas as a game of billiards, where each of these gas particles is a billiard ball bouncing off of each other. Um, so in that way, thermodynamics can be understood from the context of a game of billiards. Okay. However, um, this is an ideal gas right here we're looking at, okay? Of course, we know that gases are not ideal. Gases are complex. Um, we're not just point particles. They do take up space, and the distance between them is small, okay? So real gases, real gases in real life are particles that take up a large amount, um, large amount of space. Um, they're connected by com uh, molecular bonds, chemical bonds like we see right here, these blue lines, okay? They're not just simple uh, dots and they take up space, okay? As a result, there's little distance between the molecules. We can see right here they take up a great deal of space, there's little distance. And we can see that there are intramolecular forces that cause interactions, meaning there's like electric forces like electric attraction, electric repulsion. Okay, we haven't covered those yet, but we do know um, at least from a basic standpoint, that positive charges attract and negative charge, or excuse me, opposite charges attract and um, um, light charges repel. So the same thing will happen right here is you'll have some molecules that have areas of positive charge and other molecules that have areas of negative charge, and so on and so forth. It can it can be very complex um, beyond the level that we're going here in this class, um, and that causes um, inter electric interactions between the forces, um, electric repulsion, electric attraction, van der Waals forces. Um, so on and so forth. Okay, so why do we um, why do we treat gases as ideal instead of real? Um, the reason being is that if we were to consider all these properties right here for real gases, um, it would become extremely complex to um, determine properties of these gases here. All right. Um, so we need to start out simple, which is why we start with an ideal gas, and then from this ideal gas, we can gradually work in features of real gases. So we start out simple, and then we build off of that to get gradually more complex. And that's essentially what physics is. Physics treats everything at an idealized level, um, and then we gradually build in complexities to that idealized uh, level once we understand what's happening at the ideal level. Okay. Um, so in a way, physics can be thought about as like a uh, camera that we're gradually making um, with more and more pixels. Um, so we start out with a camera that gives us a pretty good picture, but it's a little bit blurry. Um, the pixels are a little bit too large. And then um, in physics, we make to work this. We make we work to make the lens better. We um, work to make um, the pixels much much more finer, which allows us to see and explain what's happening in a picture in greater and greater detail. So some examples of, not, of a non-ideal gas, okay? Um, atoms are not just point particles. They're made up of electrons. They're made of protons and neutrons. And even then, we'll see as we can get to quantum theory that this planetary model of the atom is not exactly what's going on, okay? Um, and then we have molecules. Uh, molecules are not just simple point particles. They're exceedingly complex. So we have methyl formate. Uh, glycol aldehyde, ethanol, dimethyl ether, say that three times fast. I just pulled this off the internet. I don't know what any of these molecules mean. All right, so I need to go back and brush up my chemistry to do that. All right, but we can see here that each of these molecules are exceedingly complex. They contain chemical bonds, they contain different atoms, and they take up space. Okay? So gas law, mini lab, and demos. All right, this is what we worked on in class, and we're going to skip this and go over to the main gas laws. Okay? So the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is an equation um, that combines all three variables that describe the behavior of gas, pressure, temperature, and volume, the three variables when you describe behavior of gas, and relates how changing one variable affects all other variables. Okay? 
So the ideal gas law states that um, the initial pressure times initial volume divided by the initial temperature of a system is equal to the initial final pressure times the final volume divided by the final temperature of a system. So what the ideal gas law tells us um, is if we change one variable, how subsequently do the other variables change? So if we change pressure, how might volume or temperature change? Okay. Um, and if this looks similar to conservation of energy where we had E1 equal to E2, final initial energy equals final energy, that's because this ideal gas law is a consequence of um, conservation of energy. So this gas law right here is a consequence of conservation of energy, which is pretty dang cool. All right, so let's look at special cases of the gas laws, okay? So Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law states that if a gas is at a constant temperature, there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume, okay? An increase, a decrease slash increase in volume will cause an increase slash decrease in pressure, okay? P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Because temperature is constant, we can cross out T1 and T2 right here, and we get P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2, okay? So this is what we saw with the Cartesian diver in class. Um, specifically what happens, as we'll see, um, is we increase the pressure and then as a result our diver sank. So there must have been something happening with the volume as a result. And we'll discuss that in greater detail with a think pair share down the line in this video. So an example of Boyle's Law right here is that if we held this container at constant volume, or excuse me, constant temperature, um, as we squeeze this shut, all right, um, if we were to squeeze this shut, what would happen is that um, there would be an increase in collisions and an increase in pressure, okay? So there, the collisions are increasing, which causes our particles to hit off the wall harder, um, which causes an increase in pressure, okay? Because our volume remains the same, our volume has no give, it cannot expand, um, the pressure will subsequently increase um, since our... Um, since the walls are rigid, they can't expand, the molecules have nowhere to go, they'll hit off the wall with a greater amount of force, and thus force, thus pressure will increase. Charles' Law. All right, so Charles' Law states that if pressure is constant now, there's a direct relationship between temperature and volume, specifically that if temperature increases slash, de slash decreases, the volume will also increase slash decrease, Okay. And so because pressure is constant, we can cross out P1 and P2, and we're going to get V1 divided by T1 equals V2 divided by T2. And we'll see an example of Charles' Law based on our mini lab here in a second. Um, so example of Charles', Charles Law, all right, not from our mini lab, but from our thermometer activity, is um, with actually with our thermometer that we saw earlier, all right? So as temperature increases, the part, as temperature increases inside, the temperature of the air molecules increases, the particles are going to collide and take up more space. Um, so the air volume is going to increase as the temperature of the air increases. That air volume is going to push down to the water, which pushes the water up the straw, allowing us to see a change in temperature. Something similar happens with mercury inside of um, a thermometer, except with mercury, it's the mercury, the liquid that's expanding instead of the air that's expanding. So now let's move on to our last law, Gay-Lussac's law, which states that volume is constant. There is a direct relationship between temperature and pressure. Um, if temperature increases slash decreases, the temperature, the pressure of the gas will also increase slash decrease. Okay, so there's a direct relationship between temperature and pressure. We increase temperature, pressure will increase if volume is constant. So V is constant here. We can cross out V1 and V2, and we can get P1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by T2. So let's take a look at an example of each law. Okay, so with our um, with our um, dry ice bomb example, okay? As temperature increases, the pressure increases for constant volume, okay? Um, so the bottle can increase its volume to a certain extent, but once the volume is not no longer able to increase, um, that's when pressure builds up, okay? Um, so our volume is no longer, no longer has any give. Our volume can't expand to accommodate the increase in temperature and thus the increase in kinetic energy of our gas. So as a result, pressure builds up because the volume can no longer expand until the um, 
pressure reaches a breaking point that the bottle can no longer sustain, and then the bottle breaks. Now, on the other hand, we have Charles' law. So Gay-Lussac's law states that if uh, volume is constant, pressure will increase for uh, as temperature increases. Charles' law says that as temperature increases, the volume increases for a constant pressure. Um, so the reason why a pressure remains constant here, even though um, it seems like pressure should be increasing, is that um, is that our volume is able to expand, and thus the surface area over which our gas molecules um, hit the surface of the balloon expands. Our surface area increases, um, so our surface area increases to compensate for the increase in force of um, the molecules as the molecules heat up. Okay. So the force, the increase in force causes the gas to expand. So you're having that increase in force over a greater surface area. So pressure will remain the same. All right. So what we can notice here is that Gay-Lussac's law and Charles' law are kind of like two sides of the same thing. Okay. Um, if there's an increase in temperature, that increase in temperature can either cause a change in pressure or it can cause a change in volume. All right. If volume can't change, pressure is going to increase. If volume can change, pressure will remain constant. And of course, it is possible, as a student, more astute of y'all may notice, um, that both pressure and volume can change at times. Um, but more often than not, it tends to be one will change while the other remains constant. All right. And then lastly, we have Boyle's law. Boyle's law is like a, a bike pump. Okay. So as volume decreases, the pressure increases for a constant temperature. So we know that the volume inside of a bike pump, or excuse me, the, the temperature inside a bike pump will stay relatively constant, okay? Um, and so as you uh, compress down on a piston, um, the pressure inside the bike pump, will, bike pump will increase as the volume will decrease, okay? So let's take a look at an example here. Do, 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 do. So the simulation right here shows um, all three at play here. So let's pump some air into this. Do, 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 All right. So we're pumping. So we got some air pumped into us now. So if we want to see the ideal gas law where all three are changing at once, all right, we can see out here where the temperature is rising and the pressure was also rising as well. Okay. And we can see right here that our temperature is decreasing, pressure is decreasing as well. All right, so again, we can see that this temperature, all right, um, is a, this temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of our gas molecules. So the more kinetic energy that our gas molecules have, the higher the temperature, all right? And we can see that heat going into the um, system causing a temperature increase. All right, so now let's say we hold the volume constant, okay? We can see our, let's actually reset this here, do, 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 bring the temperature down. So let's say we hold our volume constant now, okay? If we hold our volume constant and add heat to this system, all right, as we did in our mini lab, okay? Now this is like when we had the balloon expand, we can see that the temperature rises causing an increase in pressure. Temperature is rising, meaning the average kinetic energy of our molecules is increasing. Okay. And since the average kinetic energy of our molecules is increasing, that means that the molecules are going, our gas is now going to hit the wall with a greater amount of force, which increases the pressure acting right here. Okay. So now let's say we wanted to keep pressure constant. All right, Roberta said, now let's say we want to keep temperature constant, okay? Uh-oh, return the, that's right, our temperature was at maximum here. Let's lower it all the way back down. All right, so we can see right here that if we hold temperature constant, okay, that if we decrease the volume, that means we're gonna have more collisions um, because our gas is in a smaller volume, and thus the gas is going to hit the wall with greater amount of force, resulting in increase in pressure. Whereas if I expand now, we can see the pressure subsequently decreases because there are going to be less collisions, we have more room to, for our gas molecules to move, and thus they'll hit the walls with less amount of force. All right.
constant temperature, same uh, actually better said, same amount of force just over a larger surface area, resulting in decrease in pressure. So now let's say we hold um, pressure constant, okay? So we hold pressure constant, then we can see that the volume expands because our container is able to expand to accommodate the increase in kinetic energy of our gas molecules, thus showing us Charles' law in effect. So again, um, we can either have temperature, we can either have heat be used to raise temperature and thus increase pressure, or to increase or decrease volume. So we see right here, a decrease in volume if we decrease temperature, take heat out of the system, all right, and then increase if we increase the heat. So with that in mind, let's go through a quick think pair share here, all right. We have seen that if we squeeze a bottle containing a Cartesian diver, the diver will subsequently sink, all right. Answer the questions below to help you think about why. If the diver sinks, what does, it, what does that tell us must be happening to the density of the diver? And then B, why does squeezing the bottle affect the density? Hence, look at the diagrams at right and think about which gas law applies here. So take a moment to answer this and then we'll go back over this. All right, so if we look here, all right, if we increase, um, if our diver sinks, that must mean there must be an increase in density. The density must, must now be greater than the density of the water, okay? All right, um, as we learned back in Unit 5. So now, why is it that our density is increasing here? The density of our diver is increasing. So let's take a look at what's happening here, okay? When we squeeze the bottle, Okay, the water is going to rise inside the bottle, and thus the water is going to rise inside of the diver. Okay, so as a result, the air inside is going to be compressed into a smaller volume. Okay, um, so as a result, the pressure that we apply is decreasing the volume of the air. Okay, so since there is more air in a smaller volume, the density of the diver is thus going to subsequently increase to the point that if we squeeze hard enough, the density will increase to the point where it's greater than the density of water, and our diver will thus sink. So now let's look at how to mathematically model ideal gases. Okay, so let's say the pressure on 2.5 liters of gas changes from 100 pascals to 40 pascals. What is the new volume if the temperature is constant? Okay. So we have P1 times V1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by P2 times V2 times T2. All right, we're always going to start with the ideal gas law, and then we're going to apply the same process that we apply for conservation of energy and conservation of momentum, where we write down what we know before and after, okay? So we know that uh, P1 is equal to 1,000 um, pas 100 pascals. Our initial pressure is 100 pascals. We know that V1, our initial, temper our initial uh, volume, is 2.5 liters, okay? We know that our final pressure is decreased to 40 pascals, and then we know that our final volume is our unknown. Now we're confronted with, well, what do we do about temperature? We don't know what temperature is. Well, we don't know any specific numbers for temperature. We do know that the temperature is constant, thus T1 must be greater than T2. So what we do is proceed to the next step. We try to identify any constants, and we cross out those constants. So we're left with P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2 now, okay? So now we can plug in our knowns and our unknown in order to solve for our unknown. So 100 pascals times 2.5 liters equals 40 pascals times V2. So we get 250 equals 40 times V2, or V2 equals 6.25 liters. And a quick way to see that this makes sense is that this is in accordance with Boyle's Law. So we should expect that a decrease in pressure should correspond to an increase in our volume since we're gonna have less pressure acting on our system now. And that's what we see happening here is we have 6.25 liters of our gas, um, that our gas is occupying now instead of 2.5 liters, okay? 
So now let's take a look at mathematically modeling ideal gases. All right. Um, let's look at a second example now. So a container with initial volume of 1 liter is occupied by a gas at a pressure of 150 pascals at 25 degrees Celsius. By changing the volume, the pressure of the gas increases to 6,000 pascals as the temperature is raised to 100 degrees Celsius. We ask, what is the new volume? Okay. So we start the ideal gas law again, and then we proceed to write down before and after information again. So before, we, again, we got a mouthful of information here, so it's useful to organize this. So before, all right, P1 is going to be equal to 150 pascals, T1 is going to be equal to 25 degrees Celsius, and our initial volume is 1 liter. So P1 is 150 pascals, V1 is 1 liter, and T1 is 25 degrees Celsius, okay? And then we note that when we change the volume, the pressure of the gas increases to 6,000 pascals. So P2 is 6,000, although I have 600 written right here. Although down here, I change it back to 6,000. Hmm, interesting. All right. Um, and then the pressure of the gas increases, or excuse me, the temperature is raised to 100 degrees Celsius. So T2 is 100 degrees Celsius. So T2, Terminator 2, Judgment Day is 100 degrees Celsius. All right. Little uh, Schwarzenegger reference there for those of you all who've seen the Terminator movies. All right, and then we ask, what is the new volume? So V2 is our unknown, okay? In this case, do we have any constants? Well, we can see right here we don't have any constants. It's tempting to say that V1 and V2 could be constant, but again, V2 is what we're trying to find here, okay? So now that we have identified that we don't have any constants, we start with the ideal gas law, P1, divided by, P1 times V1 divided by T1 equals P2 times V2 divided by T2. We plug in our information, 150 pascals times 1 liter divided by 25 equals 6,000 pascals times V2 divided by 100. Again, 6,000, I just have a 600 here because that's a mistake, okay? So 6,000 times V2 divided by 100. So on both sides of the equation, we're going to get 6 equals 60 times V2. Dividing both sides by 60 yields V2 equals 0.1 liters. Okay? So now that we've seen some examples with the ideal gas law, let's do a check for understanding problem here. So let's say we have a gas that has a pressure of 6.58 pascals at 540 degree Kelvin. What will the pressure be at 210 Kelvin if the volume does not change? Okay? So you do not need to convert from Kelvin to Celsius. You are good so long as you keep Kelvin, so long as you keep your uh, measurements in Kelvin. Okay. So as a result, um, take a moment to solve here, and we'll go together over this problem here. You can pause the video at this point, work it out, um, or if stuck, stay on for a solution that I'll be showing you in a second. All right, so let's go to the solution here. All right, we note that our initial pressure is 6.58 pascals. We note that our initial temperature is 540 Kelvin. All right, we note that our um, initial temperature, or final temperature is 210 Kelvin, and then we're asked to solve for the final pressure, okay, P2. All right, we note that volume is constant. It says that, it says that volume does not change, okay? So this example of Gay-Lussac's law, all right? So by Gay-Lussac's law, since our temperature is decreasing, we should expect pressure to also decrease. All right, so we can cross out V1 and V2 since volume is constant, and we get P1 divided by T1 equals P2 divided by T2. So we get 6.58 divided by 540 equals P2 divided by 210, or 0 0.0112 equals P2 divided by 210. Okay. So as a result, we multiply both sides by 210, and we get 2.55 pascals equals P2. Our pressure equals 2.55 pascals, okay? All right, and this is our lesson on uh, modeling ideal gases.